Gentlemen, welcome back to the shop. The uh, fine grinder has been on the healing bench for long enough now to grow a lovely patina of red iron oxide. Well, shit brown iron oxide. Thank you, nitric acid fumes. So today, we're gonna put this back together and send it off to a deserving viewer in a third world shithole. And I say that with the utmost respect. As an over-entitled North American white guy, I realize that in Canada, and especially in the States, there are many locales that classify as, that qualify as third world shithole. Uh, Canada is no different. You look up north there, when they have to take an entire Inuit village and move it, because the, the ground is, or just the locale is so toxic, the kids are huffing gas, you know, that qualifies as a third world shithole. Third world shitholes do not have a monopoly on being third world shitholes. Couple of interesting developments. This uh, nylon, this is fiber impregnated, and this is ball impregnated. So I believe it was uh, Stefan Gutzwinter, again, with the knowledge on the plastiques. The deal with this is, this real deep draft here, it's real special, so they went with glass ball in order to not ruin the molds and make sure that the part comes out. But the glass, the glass ball reinforcement is more expensive because it costs more money to make spheroid balls of glass than it does to make the fiber. As an aside, that'd be an interesting process. What would you do, looking at it as an outsider, you would liquefy the glass, blast it out of a nozzle and then cool it quickly in in a low viscosity fluid maybe like air in order to get the spheres to solidify as spheres but what that does is it doesn't wear down the H13 uh, tool steel as quickly the molds are made from H13 and it's I mean it's tougher shit but uh, you know that They've got to be making a lot of parts like this if they're worried about uh, wearing out the mold for these yeah, real thin cross section. So that is why they use glass fiber. It's cheaper and they can get away with it. But for this cross section, they use the glass ball and uh, it's more expensive and it doesn't wear out the molds as quick. Now second wise, the brush with the little bit of copper in there. Super interesting technical detail. Very cool. So that copper is an anchor, and there is a spring-loaded plunger. The spring-loaded plunger is non-conductive. So as the brush wears down, eventually it exposes that spring-loaded plunger. It pops out. Now, you don't get any electricity going to this, so you know that your brush is hooped. That way you don't get the arcing and sparking and wear this out prematurely. Very, very clever. And I tip my hat to the guys that actually have run these because uh, they pointed out that this locking mechanism is terrible. It's actually, it's very, um, like it's not straight up and down. There's a bit of a draft angle on there, but normally there's a bit of a draft angle on there. But this is more like a nub, like, uh, and I guess they do that so it, it won't fetch up and it'll pop out easy. But the problem is you really got to have it engaged, like push on it hard because this will pop itself out because it's on such a uh, such a big ramp there and of course that's a pain in the ass because you get some gung-ho keener safety dude that actually wrenches on you know tightens the wheel up with a wrench son of a diddly and then you got to go ahead and try and get that thing off and this thing is backing out on you yeah no es bueno apparently that's a pain in the arse and just taking the, and we're just taking the grease out of here because I'm going to blue the gear to see the contact pattern. I was so impressed by the fact that they actually had chim chimneys in there that I wanted to see if it was actually doing anything. I'm going to use some Prussian blue here to blue this gear. We'll see the contact pattern. Very rich, rich color. Interesting though, it's ferric ferrocyanide. They say cyanide and people run for the hills, but it's not really that big of a deal. It's in, it's in a lot of nuts. Like it's in uh, walnut shells. You, the guys down south go fishing. They, they they crush up walnut shells and put it into a pond, and that uh, asphyxiates all the fish. They can't get enough oxygen. They float to the surface. Uh, good way to go fishing with, 
walnut shells that's uh, cyanide working there also the almond tree almonds are deadly poison right full of cyanide it's just there's a mutation in the almond trees that we actually eat that uh, they don't produce cyanide so you can eat the things uh, it's got such a bad rap like you use it in industry of course but uh, mainly for leaching gold out of ore it picks up uh, well it, it dissolves gold so then you can pick up the leachate and get the gold out that way but the thing is people don't realize it's not nearly as long-lived as radiation or, or oil spills or anything like that cyanide uh, breaks down in sunlight I mean it's not you know you just don't eat the stuff right anyway I digress my, my apologies also they use this oh look at that I've never used this wow been in my toolbox for a decade and a half and never used it well we're using her today also they use this apparently it picks up uh, heavy metal ions quite well there was some radiation poisoning from scrap dealers stealing uh, medical equipment in Brazil killed uh, a little yeah it was bad but uh, they apparently used this for ingested um, cesium particles cesium of course when it uh, decays radioactively blasts out a gamma ray so that's good for blast and tumors apparently okay got her back together and we're gonna put her under load here just a little friction well just hold the thing you can see the direction the orientation of turning that it's supposed to be so it's supposed to be going that words so that means that we turn clockwise from the motor end and also somebody asked me how I knew this was a, a blow or a suck and not a blow fan well, I mean, it's pretty simple. You turn it in the direction that it's supposed to be operating. And you can see here, it scoops up the air, blasts it out there. So it has to be coming from the bottom and blasting it up. And even if it didn't have that arrow on the top, you'd still know which direction it has to turn because you always want to tighten this nut when it's operating. You don't want it to loosen off on its own. Okay, there's the contact pattern on the front side of the gear nice full contact it is a little close to the inboard side of the ground gear though it's close you can see there's just a whiff of Prussian blue on the inside of that gear that means that pinion was uh, yeah it's loading up that front side of the gear but on the back side just what we want to see got very full contact so even without the shim the contact is still lovely nothing wrong with that really but the contact pattern is not as long that means there's less less meat there less beef so with the shims in it's it's contacting almost the full length of the gear so that's a nice little touch just to make sure you get the most life out of this centered metallic gear that you possibly can I haven't seen anybody else do that there's the pinion contact pattern there it looks pretty good it is quite low down on the gear though and it's just pulling off at the very like there's still some loading real close real real close to the end of the gear now the astute fine fanboys in the crowd will no doubt be jumping up and down because I didn't have it all the way together but I did have it located so the bearing was completely flush up against the hard stop here now if we wanted to change the gear tooth contact pattern we could actually shim this out a tiny bit and that would help us out to not hit the very edge of that gear however that also means that we got to change all this I don't know how much uh, movement there is I don't want to bind it up and you know how that goes wheels reinventing most times it's just not worth it so I'm gonna go ahead and fire this back together I don't foresee any difficulties because it was well built in the first place normally just have difficulties with the craptacular ones or the things that are uh, engineers wet dream this is well thought out, so shouldn't be any trouble to get this one of a kind collector's edition back together. And I'm not going to sign it, but you'll know. I got her back together. We're going to test her electrically. It's still kind of bummed. That was a kicker in the dicker. What was 
find just we almost pierced the corporate veil to see that there was some humanity behind there but no 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 despite that it still is a nice tool i'd buy it actually it's uh it's one of those it would last a long time in the home shop uh only 6.5 amps something like that so even though the brushes brush holders are craptacular probably outlast me or you and i think likely as long as you didn't have any too many 300 pound gorillas tightening this up with the spanner wrench there you'd probably do okay with that we got the usual suspects here we got the telemoscope on the current transformer 10 kilo ohm burden with uh, the 10 times probe yes it's not right uh also our old friend pincer mcpincer's in here and uh 10 turns of conductor going through here so whatever this reads it's uh divided by 10. we're going to check the inrush current with this now uh, i don't have a four inch blade or four and a half i only got the five inch so i can't use the guard safety first Hundred and ninety one uh inrush current, so divide that by ten, nineteen amps inrush. Uh just that idle. Three point six amps. That's just windage. So on 440 amps at idle, or 440 watts at idle. So here we've zoomed in on the commutation part. We can see here where the poles in the motor, in the motor rotor are changing. And we can see that little blip there. So we go peak to peak. So that's one waveform. Now we know this motor uh, has 12 commutation bars, if I recall correctly from the last video. That was a couple weeks ago though. So 12 commutation bars and figure it's turning 20,000 ripples so that's uh, 24 20 times 12 is 24 240,000 that's revolutions per minute divide that by 60 so that's uh, 24,000 divided by 6 is 4,000 so this should be 4,000 Hertz and if we look here I put in the uh, cursor bars, and if we look here, one over DX, 3.72 hertz, kilohertz rather, kilohertz, 3.7. So we're right in the range. This motor might actually be turning, if I'm not mistaken, instead of 20,000, it might actually be turning more like 17 or 18,000 RPM, no load. So this is an interesting way to. Uh, this is a, a fun little gadget. You, it's like x-ray for tools. You get to see inside to see what the motor is actually doing. And of course you zoom out and you come back to your 60 Hertz waveform. Now the power factor meter is not working properly. There's no way it can be because look at this. It's a nasty looking waveform. There's no way that can be 0.98 power factor. It just, it's just not something going on with, uh, with my home built little rig there. So I'll have to do some research on that. As I say, I'm no expert, but uh, it is fun to, you know, see how the pixies are dancing in there, at least. It gives you an idea. And you can do some other things, like uh, find out how fast it's commutating and what, uh, you know, what speed the motor's turning and this, yeah, all that sort of good stuff. Thanks a lot for watching. Keep your dick on the ice.